It's a bold world, it's a messy world, but it's an exciting world. Now, in this exciting mess that we live in, who's going to clean it up? Not our parents, not our teachers, not even our prime ministers. We are. This generation here today is going to clean up the world because we have a responsibility to bring about positive change. And if not us, who else? But what is leadership? My journey on this topic of what is leadership and how we can unlock our inner leaders started in this very building, just down the corridor. It was September 2014, and I was asked by my personal statement supervisor, are leaders born or are leaders made? And three years on, I stand by my answer that leaders are made. They are made through a constant process of reflection, leading by example, and doing it with a smile on their face. Because, see, leadership is not a gift. It doesn't come with titles. It comes with gaining the trust and influence of those around you, by building faith, by leading by example, going above and beyond, empowering others, and believing in it. See, the world we live in today is very similar to Game of Thrones. Westeros is contrived of economic, political, and social turmoil, whether it's backstabbing between families such as the Lannisters or social uprising. But there's a new generation on the rise, a generation like us, that sees a new world that can bring about positive change. The Jon Snows and the Daenerys Targaryens. See, over the past seven seasons, they've been going through a process to unlock their inner leader. And they're finally at a position now where they're bringing about real, credible change. And it's been a hard journey, but rightfully so. And they're doing it with a smile, because we have so much to be excited about. Several years ago, I was involved with my school hockey team in London. And I love playing sport, and I love playing hockey. And it was a time in my academic career where I thought I was doing great. Academic prizes, teacher recognition, lots of awards. So I assumed that people should just respect me. I thought, I'm great. But really, I had no friends. I had no trust, and I had no support from anyone around me. And the problem was, I didn't realize before it was too late. And a case in point was in the hockey team. We were 12 games in the season, and we hadn't won a single match. It was loss after loss after loss. Our coach came in, he decided to quit. Players used to come in, no one turned up at training. We were with goal difference of minus 20. We hadn't won a single match. Players used to be sent off every single week. It was a complete and utter disaster. I hated turning up on a 9 a.m. cold Saturday morning. What a waste of my time. But then it somewhat changed. A new coach came in, and he gave me the captaincy. Now, at the time, I felt great. I thought, finally, this is my chance. This gives me authority. My captain's armband gives me leadership. What I say goes. What I have to say matters. It doesn't matter what anyone else has to say. So I pulled everyone together. I said, OK, we're going to do this. You're going to play here. You're going to play there. If we want to score goals, this is how we're gonna, the route we're going to go. And if we have a short corner, we're going to do it like this. If we have a free hit, we're going to do that. I didn't care what else I had to say. I didn't even listen to the coach. I thought, he's just some new guy. Doesn't make a difference. He doesn't know me. He doesn't know the team. He's giving me the title, as I rightfully deserve. That's it. 20 minutes in, we're three goals down. It's the same as always. And I'm standing there at the back, just looking around. And I'm thinking to myself, God, these guys are all terrible. No one can play. They can't even hit a ball. We call ourselves the first 11. We're terrible. You know, I thought to myself, we need a team of just pure hashes. People like me, that look like me, play like me, and we finally actually start winning a few games. And I'm, it's getting to the point where I'm arguing with the team, arguing with the umpire, my teammates, everyone. And this guy I'm marking is just talking and talking and talking in my ear. So I just look at him, I'm shoving him on the floor. Next thing I know, the umpire goes into his pocket and sends me off. So as I then sat there on the bench, all alone, it finally occurred to me that I can't control my emotions. I wasn't emotionally intelligent. See, people used to joke with me and have fun and try and be my friends, but I used to take it the wrong way. Because I didn't know how I felt. I didn't know what made me tick. I didn't understand how I can control my emotions and my feelings. I was a prisoner of my anger and my frustration. So what do I do? I apologized to the team, I apologized to my coach, I apologized to the umpire. I started taking more accountability. 
I said to them more, I gave them the captain's armband back because I didn't deserve it. Now, they kept me captain, but I never wore it again because I hadn't earned it and I didn't deserve it. Because leadership is not about I, it's not about you, it's about others. It's about empowering others. Now, for me to be most intelligent, I finally started to learn. I had to be self-aware. Now how I felt, then manage these emotions, then use this to build empathy and social relations and stronger team partnerships. And so then, as I used to pull the team together in every single match after that, I used to say, okay, what do you think we can do? How can we improve? Where would you like to play? And then we started to win. Game started to go our way. We went from rock bottom to second in the league, and we qualified for the varsity competition. And what I learned from this, that if you're going to empower others, if you're going to lead, it starts from within. It's about less reacting and more respecting. So the challenge I had after that was when I came to the British School in the Netherlands. So the British School in the Netherlands is a very special school. With over 2,300 students and 80 nationalities, it embodies the globalized, interconnected world that we live in today. And being involved with the Model United Nations Society, I assumed that it should all be fantastic. So we used to go to conferences, we used to go to debates, we used to have resolution meetings. And you would think that with so many different ways of thinking, that creativity, innovation, and culture would ensure that we always came out on top. But it wasn't the case. And coming here as a new kid, it's always hard because you don't want to overdo it. You think, oh, I can overdo, I can try too much, I can say this, and I'll get nicknamed, or I'll get tagged with certain things. But if there's anything I learned is that I understood myself, and I knew that I didn't have the time, nor did I want to sit around twiddling my thumbs. Because if you want to make impact, and if you want to bring people together, if you want to pull people together and inspire collective action, you have to lead by example. You have to lead by doing, by taking initiative, and exactly what we did. And it didn't require any major strategy, idea, analytics, or metrics, no. It's primal. It's how you make people feel. It's how you connect with them. So all I did was, I pulled my, some of my friends together in the society, and I said, look, there's potential here. We are a massive school. We have so many nationalities. We go to so many conferences. We can build and foster a culture with at least the leaders of tomorrow. Students will come in, learn, and develop their strengths and their weaknesses, and they will go on to be better delegates in a world that is a mess, because Model United Nations embodies that world. So any meeting, so I went to every meeting, every conference, gave him my all, but I made sure that whatever I did, and whatever anyone did, was surrounded by other people. Because if you can surround yourself with the best researcher, the best analyst, the best marketing person, the best negotiator, lobbyist, all of different strengths and weaknesses, you start to learn from each other. And I knew what I was good at, but the trick was that as, as I was helping them unlock their inner strengths and their inner leader, they were doing the same for me. I was developing my skills, I was developing my strengths, I was developing my weaknesses, and I was becoming a more well-rounded person. And what did we get from this? I had the privilege to be elected as president of the United Nations Society going into my final year here. But did it stop that? No. Because I knew what I'd done before. I knew the wrongs I made before. So I used this, and I said, OK, let's keep this going. Let's build the momentum. Let's build a culture shift here. Let's do exactly what we've been doing for the last year. Keep it going. We started to win more awards. We attended more conferences. We attended the, the world's largest conference. We even had an idea to host our own event here at this school. And ever since then, there's been a succession of leaders following the same ideas, following the same goals, and building and fostering newer leaders. And I had no strategy, I had no ideas, I didn't really have any marketing. All it was is make, you make people feel good by connecting and listening to them. You're leading by doing and leading by example. And now I grew up. I came to the University of York. And in my first year, I sought out to be involved in a non-profit social impact consultancy by the name of York Community Consulting. What we do is we do social impact projects with charities, startups, local businesses. But we also connect with major firms to bring them to our campus 
and host employability and skill sessions workshops with our students, developing their skills and understanding of the industry around us. And in my first year, I was recruited to be project manager on a project with a local charity to prove its marketing and financial awareness. I thought it was a great opportunity, a great chance for me to continue developing my skills. And as I stepped into the role, I could tell the team was in disarray. The previous project manager had been fired. The team wanted to quit. The client was unhappy. The executive committee wanted to shut us down. But there was opportunity. There was a chance to make an impact again. Because if I could connect with others, if I understood myself and I could connect with others, and I could lead by initiative, lead by doing, then there was so much potential. So I sat down with the team, with the client, and I said, OK, what's going wrong here? How can we make this better? And we started to understand the reasons why the project was failing, why the client was unhappy, why the team wanted to quit. And from that, we started to develop, and we grew. We made processes. We thought about it. And by reminding everyone why we entered this in the first place, what was our original common purpose to bring social impact and to develop our skills, the project was a massive success. In the space of six weeks rather than 10, we turned it around. We won an award for social impact. And I thought, great, goal achieved. Client's happy, I'm happy, team's happy, it's all good. But then it changed. Because you see, I realized what we did was great, bringing social impact, providing opportunities for students. There's nothing like it. But we could do more. And if we, all we needed was to connect and integrate more students. So I wanted to launch a consulting conference, an event to bring students together from all sorts of different universities and connect them with all the major firms, to give them an insight into what's happening, teach them the skills, so we can do more social impact, more projects, and be even better. So apply for the position of managing partner, the top position in this organization. And I thought to myself, well, they've recruited me for a project that has been a complete and utter disaster. I turned it around, it was a great success. I've got all these great ideas. I've shown what I can do in the past. I can be most intelligent, I can lead by example, so surely they're not gonna turn me down. But that's exactly what they did. They said no. And I kind of sat there, sitting to myself, like thinking, why have they just turned me down? Why have you wasted my time? Why did you bring me in for a new project to save and then deliver, and then you're saying, now no? I wasn't egotistical. I wanted the position because I thought I could bring impact, because I believed the authority and the title would give me the command and the resources necessary to bring about the idea and change I needed. But they just said no. And in the end, at the end of the interview, they offered me some measly low rung position. And I sat there thinking, well, am I going to shake this guy's hand? Do I really want this? Not so much. But I took it. I said, fine, OK, Let's see what we can do. But then it got worse. And it got worse. I used to attend these meetings, our committee meetings. I used to hate it. I used to see someone else in the position I really wanted. I wanted that job. I deserved that job. I wanted to bring about change. And I felt I needed that title, that authority, that stamp to make it happen. And I used to look at him. Whenever I used to talk, I used to just hate myself. Like, why is this happening? You used to have 10 minutes to speak. I used to have two minutes to speak. It's like, what's the point of me even being here? It's a waste of my time. And for a moment, I haven't thought about quitting. I remember I sat there in my room, my university room. So I typed up an email saying, I just can't deal with it. I don't want this anymore, because I'm not enjoying it. I'm not having fun. And I wrote out the email, and I wanted to quit. And as I sat there, going through the moments, going through the process, I started to think, and I was like, why am I really quitting here? Because I didn't have the title. And then I thought back, and I said, do I really want to be that hockey player that needs, feels he needs a title just to bring about change? Because I showed that I didn't. I didn't need the captaincy because we finished second. Do I need that presidency of the modern United Nations to build a culture shift? No, it started before that, just by leading by doing. And in this nonprofit, as I was about to quit, I realized I don't need a title. I don't need to be managing partner. It doesn't make a difference. It's, a, it's just a thing you add to your CV to make you stand out a bit more. And I thought, what do I really care about? I care about this conference. I care about bringing this idea to life because of the potential it can bring to our society. Connecting more students, bringing firms in, expanding who we are and our brand. So that's what I did. I started to believe in the idea. 
I started to take control of it. I understood who I was, what I was about, and I connected with others. And most of all, I started to smile. Because life is exciting. It's a mess, but it's exciting. There's opportunities that all we have to do is take advantage of. And by smiling, people started to take notice. They started to care. Because how you feel, if you can be most intelligent and you can lead by example, how you feel is contagious. Remember, leadership is primal, it's resonance, it's emotional. People started to care. They jumped on the bandwagon. We started to get a team. Because originally, I asked for funding. They said no. I asked for resources. They said no. I asked for extra support. They said no. But now people wanted to join. They wanted to be part of this movement, this momentum build. We had a team. We had funding. We had resources. Was it hard? Yes. Did I care? No. Why? Because I was loving it. I was enjoying it. The first 20 speakers we approached to come to the event all said no. The next 10 said yes. We applied for scholarships, we applied for funding, we got rejected. We walked into a pub quiz and came out with a thousand pounds. And it was the best thing, because we were all so happy about it. And this is the power of a smile. Because when you start to take initiative and you start to believe in your idea, other people want to be part of it. And what happened? We had a great event. It was the first time thing that's ever happened. We connected a hundred students from five different universities and it was free. We brought up all the major firms, and students were able to secure work experience from this event, developing their employability and their skills. And what did I get out of it? Fulfillment. It's the best thing I've ever done. I didn't need a title, I didn't need a stamp of authority or recognition, because I believed in the idea, and I did it with a smile on my face. And they made me CEO a position that didn't even exist. And to me, that was almost a sense of achievement. I felt great. But it wasn't like before. Now it was like, here's a chance for me to continue doing what I'm already doing. Has my role changed? Slightly, but has what I do as a person? No. I still try and build trust through influence, by being friendly with a purpose, bringing people together, inspiring collective action, I trying to understand them. So, to anyone who's here today, I said at the start, it is incumbent on us to change this world. We don't need titles, we don't need recognition. Leadership is an infinite game, you develop it over time. What you need is to understand yourself, be most intelligent, lead by example, lead by doing, and deal with a smile on your face, because there's so much to be excited about. So let's be bold, take initiative, Let's change the world. Thank you.